is real evil. In the darkest shadows and in the most ordinary places. These are the true stories of the innocent and the unimaginable. Sandra Walder okay. and her son Jean have always been close, sharing an interest in the occult. But when Sandra finds herself lost and alone, her fascination soon turns to obsession. As she heads down a dangerous path, Jean fears that his mother is turning against him. Between the world we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. The supernatural realm is vast and uncharted, attracting those who seek answers beyond the physical world. But its mysteries are infinite and its power unpredictable. When toyed with, its consequences can be deadly. <laughs> the year is 1965. Sandra Waldron and her son, Jean, have just settled into their new home in Geneva, Ohio. Her husband, Stephen, works at a nearby engineering company. Hey. How was your day? It was fine. How about you? Everything OK here? Oh, yeah. Stephen is the only father that Jean has ever known. Great. What's for dinner? I never really knew my real father. Stephen had been my stepfather since I was two, three years old. Hey, uh, do me a favor and take Jean inside and get him washed up for dinner. Honey, I've been working all day. I just want to get out of these clothes and relax. Hey, remember what I said before we got married? Parenting is a 24-hour job, and now you're a parent. My husband never mentioned that it bothered him that Jean wasn't his child, but I do think it did bother him some. I think he resented it a little bit. Come on, Jean, buddy. Let's go inside. Sandra hopes that one day Stephen will be able to accept Jean as his own. Sandra unearths an old cornerstone. Someone had died on our property, and it had been an old schoolmaster that had lived there quite a few years back. She's intrigued. She had no idea that her property was once the site of an old schoolhouse. Honey, what are you doing? Come on, let's eat. I'll be right there. And wonders how the schoolmaster passed away. Stephen, did you know there used to be a school here? What's that? There's a cornerstone out by the side of the house. Yeah, I remember our neighbor Denise say something about that. Sandra but has always believed in the existence of spirits and their interaction Denise? with the living world. But how'd she say he died? My interest in the occult and the supernatural has been with me all my life. There's so much that we don't know. It just fascinates me. I want to know all I can about it. Wow. Sandra, please don't start with that hocus pocus garbage again. You know, you've been spending way too much time reading those weird books again. The supernatural is kind of taboo for a lot of people. My husband was more apprehensive about those things than I was. Perhaps if you spent more time taking care of the house, that'd be a good idea. Stephen, I keep the house just fine. And I happen to think that my books are fascinating. Where are you going? What about dinner? Oh, I'm done with dinner. Honey, I'm just joking.
Cassandra's discovery of the cornerstone only fuels her interest in the occult. I believe if you're open to things, then maybe they can come in. Wait, why don't you put that book down and get to sleep? And I bet you won't leave me alone until I do, right? You got it. Next month, Sandra soon forgets about the old schoolmaster. And I heard these heavy boots walk across the floor. Let's go upstairs, okay? She assumes that it's Stephen, home early from work. Stephen? no one there. It maybe alarmed me a little bit, but I wasn't really scared. It just really piqued my curiosity. Because of her interest in the occult, Sandra wonders if she could have invited a presence into her home. I decided that, well, maybe it was the schoolmaster that was haunting our house. I wasn't doing anything intentionally, but I could have possibly opened a door. A few years pass. And Jean is now 11 years old. I'm sorry. That's okay. Boys are allowed to be boys. Fight of my dad. Yeah, if they were at my house playing and they saw my dad pull up, they ran. Everybody was scared of him. You see this? This is gonna cost money. I'm sorry. I'll work it off, I promise. That goes without saying. You'll work every weekend cutting the grass until you pay for this. Gene's relationship with his stepfather never really develops. He was always angry and yelling at me. He never told me he loved me. He never said anything nice to me. And that was never good enough for him. Steven, give Gene a break. It was an accident. He was just trying to have some fun with his friends. We could all use a little more fun around here. Sandra, this is going to cost me an arm and a leg to fix. Your son has no concept of money. Steven's ambivalence towards Gene begins to put a strain on their marriage. I'm sorry. I meant our son. Been a long day. Why don't you go inside and I'll be in the wild fixed dinner? 
My husband was very critical of Jean. It was painful for me. I loved my son, and I, I wanted him to feel more comfortable at home. I tell you what, there's a scary movie on tonight. How about we watch it? Okay. Okay. As Stephen grows distant, it only brings Sandra and Jean closer together. thing to do was to watch scary movies. When we would watch movies together, uh, we'd turn the lights down, you know, get some popcorn and just make an evening of it. It was just a lot of fun um, being scared. fun somewhere else and let us watch the movie. Well, don't worry, I won't ruin your night. Besides, I'm gonna go watch the game with the guys. So how are things with you and Steven lately? The next day, Sandra and Jean go over to their neighbor Denise's house. Hey, Jean. Can you go home and get that can of beans out of the cupboard? Okay, well, okay, and hurry up, because we're going to eat soon. I never experienced anything like that before. I just felt that, that there was something evil in the house. Sandra believes that Jean was visited by the schoolmaster, but she downplays the incident, not wanting to feed into his fear. She just completely wrote it off, and I began to wonder later if maybe it was my imagination. Still, Sandra is intrigued by Jean's encounter. She hopes to one day become a published author and begins to write about his experience. After a few weeks, Jean soon forgets about his unexplainable encounter. Instead, Jean has been eagerly awaiting for the boat trip that Stephen has planned for this day. What are you doing in that boat? I was just checking it out. Well, it's not yours to check out, is it? I wasn't going to break anything. I was just sitting in it. Well, then get out of it. You got no business being in there in the first place. Whenever I was around my stepfather, you were walking on eggshells. And you knew if you just said the wrong thing, he was going to explode. And you have no respect. I go out of my way to get this boat so I can make your mom happy and take you fishing. And what do I get? Maybe I shouldn't go then. Of what? course you're going. You've been looking forward to it all week. He's just gonna yell at me. I don't wanna go. Please don't make me go. Okay, maybe I'll stay home too. No way, Sandra. What are my friends gonna say if you're not there? Under no circumstances are we going to cancel this boat trip. 
Just go ahead, Mom. I am not leaving you home alone. Sandra, quit babying the kid. He's old enough to stay home alone. I am not babying him. I am his mother and I worry about him. I'll just go to Mark and Jimmy's house until you get back. Are you sure? Well then, we'll be back at seven. Okay. All right, be a good boy. We'll see you later this evening. returns from his friend's house and sees that his parents are still out for the night. Tell me what happened. Tell me what's going on. Gene, it's okay. It's okay. We're home now. For crying out loud. You were right. We can't leave the kid home alone. Stephen, do me a favor and just get out of here so I can see what's going on. It's okay, Gene. Gene tries to explain to his mother what he saw. I saw a tall, thin man, and his face was all red and disfigured, and it just terrified me. Why am I seeing these awful things? There's something I should have told you a long time ago, but I didn't. I've got something to show you. I think the person you saw was a man who had lived here a long time ago. Sandra tells him about the schoolmaster who died on their property. He knew something was going on. I felt really bad for Gene. I did, and uh, I didn't want to see him that frightened. This man, he died right here? In our front yard? I think so. At least she not. goes on to say that she has had many encounters with his spirit and has never felt threatened by his presence. Sandra figures that Gene is just overreacting because of his age. Think of it like one of those scary movies that we like to watch. They're really scary, but in the end, it's just a movie. Gene eventually accepts his mother's explanation. She made me feel so much better and not be so afraid because I knew that my mother was there for me and wouldn't let anything happen to me. Sandra is able to comfort Jean. She wonders if there is a way to remove the spirit from the house. I went up to bed. 
be up in a minute. Well, don't take too long. see or hear from the schoolmaster again. But another problem is plaguing the house. Sandra and Stephen begin to fight non-stop. And Gene does whatever he can to escape. Gene, it's good to see you again. I guess your parents couldn't make it here today. You know how My best friend invited me to church early on, and I really liked it, and I just kept on going. Pretty much ever since. And if you need someone to talk to, give me a call. Okay, thanks. Church was a reason to stay away from the house. weeks, Sandra has the same dream over and over again. The dreams were usually much more vivid to me than regular dreams. And she wonders what these recurring images could possibly mean. fighting all of the time and it just doesn't seem to be getting any better. We cannot go on like this. You're right, Sandra. We have grown apart. I've been denying it for so long. I can't do it anymore. Stephen. It's over. finally got to the point where I had to leave. Well, I guess this is it. Take good care of your mother, okay? Although the breakup is hard, Sandra knows that it's for the best. It was a good thing I was looking to start a new life, but I had no idea what lay ahead. I was hoping it was the right thing to do. Sandra decides to move back to Texas City, her hometown. Texas City was where I was born and raised. I had family there. I hoped that would be good for me and my son both. Sandra hasn't left Geneva in years, but suddenly, the drive becomes oddly familiar. The dream was definitely an indication that I was going to be leaving. She now realizes that her dreams are visions of the future. I thought it was so obviously prophetic. Sandra finds a small house that she can afford. Hey, 
is this filthy thing doing in here? What's this? Right in the center of that floor was a star, a five-pointed star. What is it, Mom? It's a symbol. It's called a pentagram. Sandra is familiar with the pentagram, having read about it in her books on the occult. What's it mean? It means different things to different people. She also knows that people have used it to practice witchcraft. When I first discovered the pentagram, I thought, wow, there were witches here. I knew that it would just depend, you know, which way you use the star, whether it was good or bad. Uh, I'm gonna check out I wondered, was this coincidence? Or had I, by some unnatural forces, come to this house? I saw it as a positive sign that maybe, maybe I was on the right path. Over the next few years, Sandra struggles with the pressures of being a single mother and has little time to focus on anything else. She takes on odd jobs to support her and Jean, but finds herself struggling to pay the mounting bills. Since my husband and I had split, I had never really worked. I had to support myself and my son, and uh, I was scared. Sandra hopes to sell one of her stories to a publisher, but her dream of becoming an author is no closer to coming true. Come on. Hey. Jean is now ready to graduate high school. Hey, there's a zombie movie on tonight. You want to watch it? You know, I'm not into that stuff anymore. Besides, I told you I already made plans with friends. Can I put it in the car? Jean and I were getting more distant. And that made me sad because I wanted us to be close. Just don't drive too fast, okay? See you later. With Jean no longer around, Sandra finds solace in her books on the occult, which have always given her comfort. She is immediately drawn to Wicca, an earth-based religion that worships both a male and female deity. It was positive on the female side. Women were equal on men. I think that's one of the things that attracted me. She is also intrigued by the Wiccan belief that one can create change using the energy that surrounds them. Sandra creates an altar using items that represent the four elements of nature, earth, air, fire, and water. I didn't have anybody to teach me, so I had to learn everything on my own, through books, primarily. I was hoping with Wicca that maybe I could change things. Maybe I could make things more positive in my life and my son's life. Sandra performs her first ritual. Earth sanctions my magic tonight. She calls out to the god and goddess, asking them to help ease her growing debt. I call forth the forces of prosperity, truth, transformation, and purification. Sandra repeats the chant over and over again, channeling the energy around her. Mother Goddess, Father God, grant me this wish. You can actually feel like an energy. It's a sensation of like an electrical power. 
going through your body. It's a very positive feeling of power. Weeks later, Sandra receives a letter from a magazine. They plan to publish one of her short stories and have included a generous paycheck. When my first ritual worked, I was hooked. It made me feel like I had some kind of control over my life, that I can make things change when they go wrong. My mother just got deeper and deeper into the supernatural and it just drove me more awake. I'd been scared to death when I was a kid and I was afraid that something was gonna happen. Morning, Ma. Oh, gee, I had the most incredible dream last night. Actually, I think it was a vision. I really My mom just started talking to me about the occult a whole lot more. I really think that this experience is a sign of things to come. It just seems like we were becoming two different people and going our own ways. But enough about that. So, graduation is less than a month away. Have you started looking for a job? Sort of. Really? <laughs> well. Tell me, what are you going to be doing? I signed up with the Air Force. I'm leaving just a couple days after graduation. Can't believe it. Wow. Wow. I'm proud of you, Jean. Thanks, Mom. The relationship between my mother and I had gotten so strained that I decided my best chance was to back. join the military, get away, clear my head, figure out the answers to life's questions myself without my mother's influence. Soon after Gene graduates, he leaves to serve in the Air Force. When Jean was in the military, I really got into Wicca and started really practicing it and uh, doing rituals. Over the years, Jean slowly loses touch with his mother. After I joined the Air Force and I started to travel, I couldn't tell anybody what I was doing. I could hardly ever see my mom. After seven years in the Air Force, Jean returns home to Texas City. I was looking forward to seeing my mother and, and coming home. And I thought things were going to be great. Jean. He is surprised by Sandra's appearance and is unsure how to react to this unexpected change. She had black hair, black blouse, black pants. She had a necklace with a pentagram on it. I was just dazed. I'm so glad you're finally home. Looks like you remodeled while I was away. Well, let's get you set up in your old room. It's 
just as you left it. I, uh, remember this being here. Well, I'll, I'll leave you to unpack and dinner will be in half an hour. It was just too much for me. The way my mom looked, the way the house was. So now I have a picture of the devil in my room. By the last couple years in the military, I started to really go to church. And so by the time I got out, I was a very devout Christian. That evening, Sandra and Jean catch up over dinner. That looks and smells as good as I remember. Well, I know it's your favorite. So, tell me, what's been happening? Hmm. Well, life has been great, Jean. I mean, ever since I started practicing Wicca, things have changed, and for the better. What does that mean, exactly, to study Wicca? Well, I was concerned that she was Wicca practicing some form of magic. Even if her intentions were good, it, the potential for it to go wrong just is what scared me. Honey, there's nothing to be concerned about. I thought, what, what, what was it? And I thought maybe it was just headlights shining in the window. Yeah. 
Did you get up in the middle of the night to check on me? Because last night I was attacked. I was attacked by a woman that looked just like you. Destroy him. Jade, I have no idea what you're talking about. Mom. It wasn't me, I, I promise you that. Mother, I'm scared for you. I'm scared of what you've let in. You're opening doors you don't know how to close. Gene, I'm not doing anything wrong. Mom, you're in over your head. You've got to stop this right now. I don't know what to tell you other than I love you and I would never do anything to hurt you. You know this, right? I don't know anything anymore. I gotta go. I need to clear my head. Gene scours the library hoping to find something that could explain what he experienced. I had never seen lights like these before. I wanted to know what it was. He discovers a book on the occult that refers to these paranormal phenomena as sprites. These sprites, they were a product of witchcraft. I believe that her tensions were good but that she had let something in the house that was evil. I didn't want to go back, but I realized my mom was in trouble. I had to have the courage to go back in that house and fight for my mom, because I knew something was trying to destroy us both. to talk. I saw my cross in the pentagram. I was furious. I cannot believe you, mother. You are messing with things that you cannot control. Where are you going? I'm afraid of what you've let in. And I'm not gonna stick around to see what happens. I thought my mom was casting spells on me. Jean now believes that the schoolmaster was really an evil entity that his mother may have conjured up many years ago. Something came into my mother's life when I was a child and tried to show her dreams and tried to take her down a path into the occult. He cuts all ties with Sandra realizing that there is nothing he can do to stop her. I felt that my mom was too far gone. The more I talked to her, the more I thought that she was lying to herself, lying to me. So I finally left. Sandra is devastated by Jean's angry departure. I was really upset that he thought I was causing something. I couldn't understand maybe why he would think I was doing it because I said I was a witch. But she continues to practice Wicca despite her son's warning. I was gonna do a dedication to Isis. 
Isis is the supreme mother goddess of ancient Egypt. She is also considered the most powerful deity of the Pantheon. Great goddess Isis, I dedicate myself to you. In this place of power, I open myself to your energy. Great goddess Isis, make me one with your spirit. I dedicate myself to you. Sandra prays to Isis, power, believing that she can guide her through this turbulent time. In this place of power, I open myself to your energy. I open myself to your energy. Great goddess Isis, make me one with your spirit. I dedicate myself to you. Goddess Isis, I dedicate myself to you. Goddess Isis, I dedicate myself to you. Close the door to the other side. I think they were demons. This scared me so bad that I said, that's it. I want out. I don't know what I'm doing. It was definitely something I couldn't control. You're messing with something that is beyond our comprehension. Jean and Sandra eventually reconcile their relationship, and they are closer than ever before. Now we talk almost every day, and we're trying to make up for lost time. Is that what everything else is going well? Yes, it is. Jean is now a minister and counsels people who are victims of supernatural events. Sandra finally realizes her dream and becomes a published author. <laughs> she never practices Wicca again. She believes that her inexperience with practicing magic allowed these demonic entities into their lives. It's possible that my interest in the occult all my life could have opened some doors. I could have been manipulated by demons or other spirits. I just don't know. I don't know the answers. I believe that it started out as one evil spirit that just became many and tried to destroy our lives. In this world, there is real evil. In the darkest shadows and in the most ordinary places. These are the true stories of the innocent and the unimaginable. When the Johnsons moved to a small town in New England, they disturbed the peace of a dormant presence. Lost souls inflict fear upon the living, shattered passion waves. With the help of a team of witches, an embattled family fights the unknown to take back their home and their sanity. Between the world we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. Nestled between the majestic green mountains and the fertile river valleys of southern Vermont lies the town of Chester. 
the birthplace of thousands of young soldiers whose lives were tragically cut short in the Civil War. Today, local legends chronicle centuries-old accounts of untimely deaths. And every now and then, the agonizing cries of these young souls can still be heard echoing from beyond the grave. The year is 2005. Look at that place. That is a beaut. Are you serious? Libby and Sean Johnson, Absolutely. along with their two daughters, seven-year-old Grace and five-year-old Willa, search for the perfect home. Now, this place is a classic. Having moved from Fort Lauderdale, Florida nearly a year ago, they believe that Chester, Vermont is a town of promise. We could restore it. We really liked the pace of life here in New England, and we thought, Living in a small, rural town would be a nice place to raise our children. What do you think? Well, he needs a little imagination. I mean, this place could be great. The Johnsons have been living in a small, two-bedroom apartment for over a year while looking for a place of their own. Hi, this, this is Sean Johnson. I'm over at the house on School Street. Yeah, I was wondering if we could see it today. The house needed probably $200,000 worth of general construction to get it to be livable. Sean was the eternal optimist and was so excited. I mean, it's got great bones. What? Look at yeah. that, the house, it's solid as a rock. I, on the other hand, was thinking, I could never live in this house. It needs so much work. I don't know about this, Sean. This place she wanted a finished product. She didn't want to live through construction. Do this. Sean, who runs a car dealership from home, offers to oversee the renovations. I could look after the girls too. Libby figures she can use this opportunity to go back to work, something she's always wanted to do. Look, thank you. So we thought we'd give it a shot. Okay. Sean continues to assist with the construction and manage his business from the apartment. While Libby takes a job as a secretary at the local elementary school. Finally, after 10 months of construction, the renovations are nearly complete. Hey, Freddie, how's it going? One afternoon, Libby checks on the workers during her lunch hour. That's okay, I just wanted to see how you guys were doing. Great, moving on. Oh! This is incredible. She discovers dozens of old family photographs, letters and documents dating back to the Civil War. Yeah, you never know what you're gonna find once you start tearing down these old walls. I wanna keep these. Could you give me a... Let me know if you find any more of these, sure. okay? Sure, sure, no problem. I was very excited to find those documents, just to learn a little bit more about history and the people that lived here. It's just interesting to think about how people lived in New England with no hospitals and grocery stores and ATMs and cars. In March of 2006, the Johnsons finally move into their new home. The renovations are not completely finished, but Sean and Libby can wait no longer. All right, get it while it's hot. My husband and I were so excited to be moving into the house. It would have been the year of blood, sweat, tears, and lots of money trying to renovate this house. And 
for you. <laughs> the kids, on the other hand, were not as excited. I don't like it here. It's big and scary. You're gonna love this house. Okay, kiddo? Okay. After an exhausting move, the family settles in for the night. The girls sleep with their parents while the floors in their room are refinished. Get away! Get away! Get away! It's all right, honey. Just wake up. It's okay. It's okay, honey. Wake up. It's just a dream. Grace, wake up. It's okay. It's all right. There was someone coming after me. She saw a person come into the room with strange-looking eyes and was coming toward her. Oh, it's just a dream, Gracie. Hey, you want to sleep in our bed tonight? Come on. I just thought it was, you know, her nerves from being in a new place. She just was scared. I heard the door shut. I heard a door slam. And then I heard another door slam. My ears are hearing the door slam, but I'm not seeing any door slamming, and I can't figure it out. It didn't make sense to me to run around the house and, and test all the doors and this and that because I knew it wasn't that. But you don't know what to do. So? Nothing. I didn't see anything. I don't get it. Oh, it must have been the wind. Sean downplays the incident because he doesn't want to worry Libby any further. Great. Don't you think it's weird the girls never woke up? The next morning, for something that's completely not logical. This one you're saying we have ghosts. 
I have never been a believer in the supernatural ghosts, anything like that. Whether we have a haunted house. <laughs> I'm very scientific. I don't have faith in a lot of things that I can't feel and touch. What if it is haunted? We couldn't get our money back. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, girls, let's go. Mommy's got to go to work. I love you. Have a nice day. Let's go. All right, y'all, have fun. fun. <laughs> The following week, the girls' room is finally complete. Okay. Who wants a story? Oh, I do, me, I do. I, do. <laughs> I want to do a puzzle. I hate puzzles. Listen, Willow, we'll read a story tonight, okay? And then tomorrow night, you can do a puzzle with Daddy, okay? Okay. This is called The Lonely Fairy. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, there was a lonely little little girls laughing and giggling. <laughs> and as soon as I opened up our bedroom door, the voices stopped. Well, I must have left the TV set on. And then everything was quiet. I thought, well, maybe I was just dreaming that. the following morning. Grace, Willa, come on girls. You gonna be late for school. Hey, what's this? I don't know. Okay, come on, zip up, get downstairs. Daddy's got breakfast wake, okay? okay. Love you too. Hey, sleepyhead. Rise and shine. Hey, hey, hey. What's this puzzle doing over here? I thought you hated puzzles. The fairies wanted to do it. What? There were two fairies here. <laughs> we played all night. That sounds like a wonderful dream. It wasn't a dream. Okay. Well, what did these fairies look like? They had white dresses, white stockings, and they had ribbons in their hair, too. Where do these fairies live? under a tree in their yard. Well, that sounds wonderful, honey. Libby is puzzled. <laughs> 
Why don't you go, brush your teeth, and wash up, get dressed, okay? She can't remember Grace's dreams ever being so vivid, and knows it's unlike her daughter to make up stories. Part of me really wanted to believe that she just had a very overactive imagination. Over the next few days, neither Libby nor Grace mentioned the fairies. Things seemed to quiet down around the house. Then, one night. Why are you making a fire? Because it's chilly. No! No, put it out! Grace, what's wrong? There's nothing to be afraid of. Grace, calm down, sweetie. What is? She was terrified that we'd burn the house down. in the fireplace all the time. Grace's sudden fear of fire worries Libby. Come on, honey. Let's go upstairs. She wonders what's behind her change in behavior. It's okay. I'll sit up there with you for a little while. In the days that follow, Libby manages to forget about these strange incidents and settles into a normal routine. <laughs> Grace, Will, are you in here? I could hear young children giggling. It made me feel really uncomfortable. I didn't really know what to think. Grace, Willa, are you guys up here? What is this? What is this a picture of? It's our house, and that's the fire. Grace had drawn our house on fire. This was very alarming to me. Grace, honey, why would you draw a picture like this? I'm afraid you and Dad are going to die in a fire. No, honey. Mommy and Daddy aren't going to die in a fire. The fairies, Mommy and Daddy, died in a fire. Grace, honey, that was just a dream. The fairies aren't real. But it wasn't a dream. They're real. It was interesting to me that she was so adamant that it wasn't a dream. I'm beginning okay. to wonder maybe if there's something coming into play that isn't but we're not natural. Die, okay? We've had too many things happen in the house to just write them off as random events. Libby is beginning to believe that her house may be haunted. She hopes that history can shed some light on what has been happening. Hey, what are you doing up here? What's that? Stuff the workers found when they were up here renovating. I'm I decided to try and figure out you know, if these two fairies that Grace is talking about happen to be little girls that used to live here, if there was a fire in the house at some point. I'm sure you're overthinking this whole thing. There were many moments when Sean tried to talk me out of believing that something paranormal was happening. We both really wanted it to be something natural. But whatever it is, I think we should keep the whole thing quiet. Being the new people in town, I was concerned about airing too much. Look, I'm just trying to figure this out. I'm starting to think I'm going crazy. Okay, look, I'm gonna take the girls for a walk. Do you wanna come? No, no, you go ahead. I've got some errands to run. Okay.
Ruby takes the old photographs and documents to the Chester Historical Society. Now, it says here that that old house was used as a barracks during the Civil War. I was actually wondering if there was any record of any fire. No. Unfortunately, Libby doesn't receive the answer she's looking for. The director finds no evidence of a fire on her property. I I've seen any evidence of a fire. Yeah, what about these photographs? Do any of these people look familiar well, to you? I don't know. Let me take a look. Yeah. Oh, well, look at that. that there seems to be something stuck here. Isn't that right? Well, let me see. Oh. Is that... He tells Libby that this is an early 20th century uh, photograph of Chester's Civil War veterans. Like a picture of the 50th anniversary of the uh, Gettysburg Battle. Who are the girls? Well, I don't know, but they certainly don't seem to belong there. It's strange because these girls match to a T a description of the fairies that Grace kept talking about that would go into her bedroom. You know, it sort of looks to me as though that they just dropped in there. Somebody put them there with no rhyme or reason. Libby wonders if these are the same two girls that visit Grace at night. <laughs> Libby remains calm for her family. Can you give me a kiss goodnight? Yes, come here. Mwah. Come on. Okay. Hey, honey, can I show you something for a second? Let's pop over there. I want you to do something for me, okay? Now, I'm going to show you this picture, and I want you to tell me if you see anybody in it that you recognize. The fairies! I was not surprised that Grace said that. I just knew that those little girls who were in the photograph had something to do with the house. Hey, Grace, come on. Why don't you go upstairs and get ready for bed, huh? I'll be right up in a minute. There is an explanation. She's just a child. Well, you heard the girls giggling in the middle of the night. That was a dream. Sean cannot come to terms with the fact that the house could be haunted. I couldn't explain it. So therefore, I was a little conflicted on what it could be. All these things were happening that were pointing to something other than normal. She's been playing Ring Around the Rosie with two little fairies who happen to look exactly like the little girls in this picture. I never taught her that song. Maybe she picked it up at school. No, I talked to her teacher. She said they never sing it there. I mean, did you know that that song is about the plague? It's a song about death, Sean. She is obsessed with death. Ashes to ashes, we all fall down. What do you want to do, move? We've put more money into the house than it even cost to, to buy. I'm sorry. So it, it just wasn't an option to sell the house. I just don't know what to do. Grace wasn't afraid. It wasn't so scary at that point that I felt that we were in danger. Sean, when you heard the door slamming, did it wake you up? Libby begins a record of her experiences. When you heard the door slamming, were you awake, or did it wake you up? I, I don't know. Sean. I, I was asleep. It woke me up. OK, well, what about uh, when you heard the girls giggling? I wrote down the time, the weather, what was going on in our family. Um, if anyone was sick, if there was any kind of unusual tension or stress, I really wanted to make it as scientific as possible. Sean! Jeez, Libby, come on, can I just watch the game? Did you leave the window open upstairs? No, I did not.
I felt like I was being watched and like there was a presence in the room. fast as I've ever seen anything move. You know it as well as I do, and you're gonna have to face it. I saw something, a black figure. I was at the window, and and I felt something behind me, and, and I turned around, and, and I saw this black thing standing in front of me. It darted under the bed, but it was right there. I saw it. It's real. Libby no longer believes the ghosts are harmless and searches the internet for a way to remove the spirits. When I just thought, you know, why is this happening? Should we really believe in this? She learns she can remove the spirits by smudging the house with sage. Smudging is a Native American ritual where sage is burned to cleanse a space of negative energy. It sounded a little far out, but at this point I was feeling really like, well, what can it hurt? It's gotta help. That day, Libby finds a local store that sells sage. Excuse me. Am I helping? I was actually wondering if you have any sage. I Did was a little bit embarrassed by the whole sage smudging idea. It's just not something I would normally try. Okay, did you want a bag or did you want smudge sticks? Smudge sticks. Two, actually. They're gonna be five dollars a piece. That afternoon, Sean keeps the girls occupied so Libby can right, perform right, the smudging. Don't stay on the sidewalk, all right? Don't get too far ahead of me. You sure you want me to stay with you? No, I'll be all right. You go ahead. Okay. All right. All right. Hey. Harm. Please leave this house in peace. I walked around the house with burning sage and said a little wish in every single room. Please leave this house in peace. After the smudging, Things return to normal for several weeks. Libby is relieved that the spirits have finally left. Then one night, Grace suddenly falls ill. What's up, kiddo? She doesn't feel so hot. Oh, what's the matter? She has an upset stomach. Oh. Do you want to sleep with mommy tonight, sweetheart? I decided to have her sleep in my bedroom with me. Me too. In your bed too. All right, all right. I guess I'm sleeping in Grace's bed tonight. Good night. I want to sit next to Mom. No, I want to sit next to Mom. Okay, I'll get in the middle. Both. Good night, Dad. Good night. Good night, Willa. Good night, Grace.
teeth got really tight, like they were holding me down. Who are you? She's not here, she's sick. I tried to get up and I couldn't move. Get away! Something in this house. Sean was finally starting to come around and not be completely in denial that something was happening. The next day. Don't you think it's time we brought in some professional help? Like paranormal investigators? I don't know. I don't think I want to be any part of that. At first, I, I resisted that because I, I just didn't want our laundry aired. I thought Libby and I could handle it internally. Do we really have any choice? Fine. Let them come. I think they're here. Libby contacts ISIS Investigations, a team that specializes in helping people who are experiencing paranormal activity. God, I hope we're doing the right thing. What you looking at? Okay, hey, who wants to get some ice cream? Mm. Oh, what are you doing? <laughs> okay, come on, leave that. If you're doing good, we'll come back to it. As a safety precaution, Sean takes the girls out of the house during the investigation. The members of the ISIS team are all followers of Wicca, a new religion of life and nature which finds its roots in ancient ways. Patricia Gardner is the co-founder and director of the group. Wiccan is another word for witchcraft. Everything that we do is geared to the protection of the Earth and the creatures that live on it. Hello. You must be Libby. I'm Patricia. Thank you so much for coming. Along with Angela Kaufman, co-director Dana Winters, and Justin Staley, each member is a gifted psychic. Something. It was a little startling to me that the first thing they did was to head over to this tree that I had never even mentioned before. Angela feels a peculiar sensation coming from the tree. And I noticed uh, a very strong, abnormally warm feeling coming from it. And it seemed to be uh, a center of activity. This is very sad. Something terrible happened here. Yes. I can feel it. The energies around the tree were very chaotic. We all felt that there was something very strange under or around the tree. Let's go inside. We'll explain everything. Who are you? While Libby shows the team the hot spots in the house, Justin tries to capture evidence of paranormal activity. Angela, a 
the psychic sketch artist, uses art to recreate images in her mind's eye. What I'm trying to do is to use myself as an instrument to mirror what's going on in the room. There was a lot of spiritual activity going on in the house. I did get a couple of specific impressions. One being this figure in a Civil War uniform. illustration of the two girls from the photograph found in the attic. <laughs> I got the sense that two little girls' spirits were kind of mischievous. They were just looking for someone to communicate with. Angela feels the impact of several spirits. The left part of my head starts to hurt. My first thought was that something is present in the room and it doesn't like us, then it's trying to make us feel uncomfortable. This is, um, this is my daughter's room. Patricia and Dana immediately pick up on the presence of the two little girls. We assume that it was the girls playing with the cat to let us know that they were in the room with us. That's so odd. That, that toy's been broken for months. <laughs> Libby hopes that Patricia can reveal why the spirits are haunting her house. These are interesting. Hmm. This was the one, though, that, that held the most interest to me. This is the one I was telling you about, the one with the two little girls. Oh. Oh. This is amazing. Patricia runs her hands over the images on the photograph. These are the little girls. As her fingers pass over the two girls, she senses a change in temperature. The warm feeling I'm sensing oh, means means that they're still earthbound. Well, who are they? What do, what do they want with my daughter? Patricia believes the girls once lived in the house and don't know how to cross over. Some but the presence of a fire remains a mystery. Negative. It, well, there are others. So many others. Renovations. Patricia believes that renovations must have awakened the dormant spirits oh, yeah. in the house. We basically started from the bones and rebuilt it. When you renovate things, even if something has been asleep for a hundred years, that's the best way I know of to wake it up. Because they want to know what you're doing to their property. Because in their minds, it still belongs to them. We need to perform a ceremony, which will help some of the spirits here move on to another plane. Okay, um, what do we need to do? We'll perform what we call a magic circle and then a crossing ceremony. begin the crossing over ceremony by casting a magic circle. A magic circle is what witches use to protect themselves before rituals. It's a protective barrier between us and the rest of the universe. Candles are lit to absorb negative energy in the house and replace it with positive energy. Mm -hmm. 
and incense is burned to prepare the mind and body before the ritual. If we can now please all join hands so we can start the ceremony. I conjure thee, O circle of power, that thou beest a boundary between the world of men and the realms of the watchtowers, a sacred space of protection, a shield against all evil. I conjure thee, O circle of power, that thou beest a boundary between the world of men and the realms of the watchtowers, a sacred space of protection, a shield against all evil. Justin, if you will please bless the four corners. Ye gods of the watchtowers of the east. In Wicca, guardians known as watchtowers are called upon to protect the four directions of the circle. We call upon you to protect the sacred space. Ye gods of the watchtowers of the west, we call upon you to protect the sacred space. Be lords of the watchtowers of the dead. During the ritual, incense is offered to the guardians in exchange for their protection. We can all close our eyes now. Now protected by the magic circle, they begin the crossing over ceremony. We open a doorway so that the spirits can cross over to where they are supposed to be. For some of them, you pick up on their sadness or their fear. I think they've gone. Afterwards, a feeling of calm and peace envelops everyone in the room. Most of them have left. That's it. Patricia tells Libby she We're believes done. that most of the spirits have Do moved through change. the open door to the west, to a place and called so. the Summerlands, yes. a Wiccan version of the afterlife. Things have returned to normal for the Johnson family. But they will never forget how their lives were touched by the supernatural. This whole experience absolutely changed the way I think about things. I do believe in a soul now, which was a huge revelation for me. I think it's really been sort of a gift to our family. Libby, come here. You might want to take a look at this. Ooh, truce. <laughs> what is it? Looks like there was a fire here. 
he found an old brick foundation that had been all burned out. There's even burnt clothes in the ground. Black ash, charcoal covered wooden beams, and burned clothing indicates the presence of a devastating fire long ago. Grace was right. There really was a fire. No human remains were ever found beneath the tree. anyone actually died in the fire may remain a mystery forever. Stacy Jones knows the dangers of the supernatural world. She's a former police officer who relies on her training to methodically and safely search for human spirit. But an innocent mistake puts her only son at risk, and Stacy must battle the dark side to save his mortal soul. Between the world we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. Drawn by the allure of exploring the unknown, enticed by the chance of proving the impossible, Paranormal investigators must stay grounded in their quest. But when skepticism blinds the truth, perilous consequences threaten the innocent. Research, documentation, evidence. These are the keys to a solid investigation and to finding the answers we seek. The Brown Lady of Raynham Hall, taken in 1937. It is the most famous alleged ghost photo of all time. Take a close look. Pretty provocative. Could it be a fraud? Stacy Jones Possibly, could be founded a Central New York Although Ghost Hunters in 1997. Being an ex-police officer sets me apart from other paranormal investigators because I really want that evidence to support what our claims are. Next one. Okay, with energy photos such as this one, how do we... Along with her team members, Stacy scientifically investigates human spirit hauntings. We're looking for the evidence to support life after death. It's ironic. Any other questions? Stacy lives with her husband, Lloyd, and her 15-year-old son, Jamie, in Syracuse, New York. Although Lloyd is a true skeptic, he is a supportive husband and a devoted stepfather. Jamie has had a unique upbringing. Paranormal is pretty normal for me. My mom deals with it almost every day. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yes. Aren't ghosts, if they do exist, supposed to be dangerous? Well, the human spirit poses a danger that is more psychological than physical. Uh, what are the exceptions? The exceptions? <laughs> well, that's a question for my friend John Zaffis, if I ever heard one. Ladies and gentlemen, our expert on the dark and dangerous, Mr. John Zaffis. Thank you, Stacy. While Stacy focuses on human spirit cases, her longtime colleague from Connecticut specializes in a much darker realm. Hello, I'm John Zaffis, 
and for the past 25 years I've studied malevolent non-human spirits, better known as demons. And as a demon, When dealing with something on a negative level, usually the activity is very intense. You'll have furniture moving around, you can have really foul smells. Personalities will actually be changed in these types of situations. The whole environment usually changes. I really study more about not ghosts, but entities that are dark and evil. John Zaffis has a very different spectrum of what he deals with in the paranormal. As knowledgeable as I am, I'm not knowledgeable enough to take on cases that are negative in any way. Hey, Jamie, you still skateboarding? Every day. Hey. Got a line in the historic cemetery a few hours out of town. A lot of activity. Alleged activity. Sorry. Mm. Alleged activity. We're hoping to get out there Saturday if you can make it. Saturday? I told the guys we'd go for a picnic on Saturday. Come on. We'll see what I can do. That was my first year lecturing, and I was also a full time college student. It was a really busy time. Despite her full schedule, Stacy knows it's important to spend time with Jamie. That Saturday, family and work overlap. Nice spot. Yeah, well, we thought you'd like it. It's slightly less depressing than the office on a Saturday night. You know? Which, by the way, I gotta leave for. So, you want to come with me, Jamie? I'll take you home on the way in. Nah, I'd rather stay here and skate. Mom's going to be here all night. Yeah, but it's better than watching TV by myself. Can I stand with you? Well, we'll make it an early night, I promise. Okay. All right. Mm. Say hi to Casper for me, okay? Uh -huh. Sure. <laughs> Bye, Lloyd. See ya. Before entering the cemetery, the team tests equipment they will use to find anomalies associated with human spirits. Electromagnetic field monitors detect abnormal shifts in energy. Infrared cameras record light sources invisible to the naked eye. And digital audio recorders capture sounds imperceptible to the human ear. Okay, there you go. But not all the equipment is sophisticated. There we go. What's that? Dowsing rods. What do they do? Some people believe that they can mystically find just about anything a person seeks. Oh, Regina, that's ridiculous. And you know it. Dowsing is an ancient procedure for finding ionized objects underground. Water, metal, nothing more, nothing less. I have never personally used dowsing rods. I, I've never had anybody in my group seriously use dowsing rods. I doubted them a lot. Can I try? Well, I guess so. All right, here's how you do it. Put them parallel, and when they come in, start tapping like that. You got something. All right? Don't forget. Jamie normally doesn't go on investigations with me, but we found that cemeteries are usually pretty benign, so I felt pretty comfortable taking him. Wow. This place is huge. The cemetery has a dark history. It entombs the remains of soldiers who met violent deaths in every American war since the mid-1800s. We got emails from people stating that they have gone in and seen shadows moving. I'm skeptical of what people report because they go into places wanting to be scared. Can you take this? Jamie and I will take the two eastern quadrants back here, and Regina you and James, you go to the two, the northwest and the southwest quadrants, right? Yeah. 
So what am I supposed to do with these things? Oh, well, if you listen to James and Regina, you can use them to try to find a specific grave. Like what? Oh, I don't know, honey. Smith? Take me to a grave, Mark Smith. Nothing. Well, huh, imagine that. Come on, honey, we've got a lot more ground to cover. Mom. What is it? Some, something's happening. What? What's happening, Mom? What are you doing? I'll be damned. You found a grave Mark Smith. <laughs> Don't you find that a little freaky? I was intrigued by it, but I was still skeptical. No, Jamie, be rational in a cemetery this big. There's probably a hundred graves Mark Smith. <laughs> then, uh, how do you explain the rods vibrating? Probably metal deposits in the soil. It's My mom's constantly downplaying experiences. There's always a scientific conclusion that could be made off these facts that we find. Jamie, what is the first rule of paranormal investigation? Be skeptical. Exactly. Those things are probably going to detect metal ten more times tonight. Now, come on, let's go. Stay close to me. I don't want you wandering off. Coffee? Uh, not right now. Okay. I'm gonna check in with Stacy. Hey, uh, we're in the old section. Anything interesting happening there yet? Not really. It's still early, but I'm not sure there's much to find out here. Jamie. Sorry. Take them. You all right? Just take them. Well, put them in my backpack. Here. Mom! What is it? What is that? What are you doing? Back up. Slowly. Stacy fears they've just encountered shadow people. They're black forms that dart between trees and tombstones. The sense I got from it was the negative. James, Regina, pack it up. Meet us at the van. Stacy out. Read that. Over. Hey, we're packing this up and moving on. Come on. What's up? Stacy says we need to go. My investigators have learned over the years that I don't overreact with anything. And when I come back concerned, they know that there's something up and they know it's time to pack up our, our gear and get out. Some researchers believe shadow people are dark beings. Others think they're negative psychic energies. Either way, Stacy knows they aren't human spirits. I really felt vulnerable. It wasn't safe anymore. 
and I've learned over the years to trust this instinct. Mom, I don't remember this place. James! Regina! We heard footsteps behind us, but there was no one there. Is that them? I felt like I was being surrounded. There was something out there that obviously had an interest in us. something. Shadow yeah. people, I think. <laughs> but I didn't get any documentation. I think I need a better camera. Or maybe there was nothing there, huh? <laughs> Jamie, wake up. Jamie, about last night at the cemetery, I think we ended up just scaring ourselves more than anything. What about this? Oh my God, Jamie, what did you do to yourself? I didn't do anything. Well, of course you did. That didn't just appear by itself. What in the world happened? I didn't do anything. It just like appeared, I swear. In the back of my mind, I really had an egging suspicion that something had gone on. But then my rationale kicked in. It's there. If you didn't do it, how did it get there? What are you so doing? I basically cleaned it up and let it go. Stop! You gotched it. We gotta keep it. I just felt completely betrayed. Go in my room. No. Jamie. We can try to downplay it as much as we want, but what are the chances of it being a perfect star? In the following days. Jamie senses the world around him changing. As the school year begins, he's numb to everyone. That's enough. Outside, now. Look, I don't know what kind of stunt you're pulling in there, but I'm not going to tolerate it. I didn't do anything. All right, wise guy. Let's see if you remember for the principal. But I, but no, I didn't do right anything. right now. Right now. Let's go. What's going on? Nothing. Do you remember anything about incessant mumbling? No. I swear. Nothing is nothing. Is nothing. Nothing is nothing. Is nothing. Jamie. 
What's wrong with you? You want another detention? What for? That's two. You want another one? Why? Enough. Everything in my mind was completely normal. There was not a single thing wrong. But then there's all these things happening, and for the sake of me, I could not figure out why. Get out of here. Let's go. Over the next week, Jamie feels like he's living in a fog. I was changing. Everything was just constant depression, anger. There was no happy point of my life. He wishes he could talk to his mom, but she's always too busy. I just had nothing. All I had was to sit in my room, listen to music, and that's it. The tape dispenser just swipes across my room. Did that just happen? It, it almost seemed fake. I thought, maybe my house is haunted. Jamie! Jamie! Mom, something just happened upstairs. What? I don't know, but... Gosh, what the heck is this? Three detentions in one week? Mom. I don't know what's going on right now. Well, obviously, there's some sort of problem. I don't have a problem, Stacy. But if I did, do you think you could fix it? What the heck is that supposed to mean? I'm going to bed. Jamie! Stacy hopes that Jamie is just going through a phase. This is not Jamie. This is not Jamie's behavior. He doesn't get in trouble like this. He's a good kid. But for now, she has to study and prepare for another lecture. After hours of work, Stacy is exhausted. Night, Jamie. I love you.
As Halloween nears, Stacy lectures constantly. Hey, have you, either of you guys seen my diamond earrings? What, they're not in your jewelry box? No, no I already looked there. Have either of you seen my earrings? No, no, I haven't seen them. Oh, for gosh sakes. Oh, I'm gonna be late. Yeah, me too. Look, you, after dinner, homework. You gonna check my answers? You know, I might. Jamie has never felt more alone. My mom was the last person I could turn to for help. I had no friends to turn to for help. My stepdad wasn't even in question to turn to for help. Just quite literally no one. gross, frictiony, wet noise. slowly goes back into the kitchen. It goes into the computer room. It was just a constant goose chase. It was interacting. Jamie passes the night alone, afraid the one person he used to count on won't believe him. Jamie! Should I tell my mom? After the star, the tape dispenser, every time I tell her, she'd blow it off, put it aside. What's wrong? I heard the sound. It was like lip smacking. Except for louder. It was disgusting. Oh, honey, it was probably just the neighbor's cat crying again. You know that they leave it out all the time. It's so cold, they never let it in. I did have suspicion that it may have been something that Jamie made up just because he could have heard me talking about it before. Maybe this was the way he was getting this attention from me. Why don't, why don't you ever believe me? My view of my mom completely changed. I'm going up to my room. Jamie, I did so incredibly real. The idea struck me that things were gonna get just completely out of control violent. Stacy wonders if there's more to Jamie's behavior than a plea for attention.
Jamie's been hiding his report card. He was failing everything. What exactly is going on with this kid? And I was absolutely and totally furious that my jewelry was in Jamie's drawer. That's it, I've had it with this kid. If discipline is what he's looking for, he's absolutely gonna get it. Why are you going through my drawers? What are these doing in your drawer? Whatever. Jamie, what is going on with you? I'm out of here. Come back here, Jamie! Jamie! Jamie? You stole from me, Jamie. You stole from me and you lied to me. Yeah, I guess I did. Bad, bad, Jamie. Talk to her like that. Shut your mouth, Lloyd. You might embarrass yourself in front of my mom. All right, stop it. Just stop it right now. Mom, what, what I do? All right, that's it. Go on upstairs. I'm tired of looking at you. Go, go on. This relationship completely turned on a dime in, in less than three months. To the point where I just really didn't even want my own son around me and I just didn't even like him at that point. And that scared me even more. Everything just went to hell. I could not find a single thing to be happy about. What is going on here? This is this seriously, seriously all going on right now? Yeah, I don't have any control of this. I hate the idea of stealing, but sure enough, I did it. It just freaked me out so much. I cannot figure out why. Constant negative, 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 negative. This is completely out of my hands. Well, maybe it is just me. Maybe I am a bad person. My husband said that I shouldn't overreact. I didn't agree. This was not Jamie. This was not the way he is. wasn't any explanation of why that book came flying down the stairs. There was nobody there. There was really something going on here. Okay. Sure, I'm good. Lloyd may be a supportive husband, but for now, Stacy's on her own. I started putting things together, saying, okay, there is something paranormal going on in my house. Stacy suspects Jamie is the focus of a poltergeist. Almost without exception, Poltergeists center on pubescent youth. The theory holds that intense but repressed emotions trigger psychokinetic energy. It would explain the behavior, the book flying through the house, the lip smacking. It would explain a lot of things. Thankfully, poltergeists rarely last longer than a month or two. I figured it's something that's going to be so short-lived that I could deal with it and we can move on. the next evening. Oh, hey, Jamie, I need to talk to you. What are you doing at home? Don't you have night school? No, I'm not going anywhere tonight. What? Did the principal call again? No, you're not in trouble. Please just sit down.
Okay, listen, I, I think I understand what's been going on. I think you've been the target of a poltergeist. What? It would explain a lot of the things that have been going on around here, like the weird noises, stuff like that. Stacy fears she's dealing with something far more dangerous than a poltergeist. I'm petrified. Something's attacking my son. It wasn't something that I could stop, and there was nothing that I could pinpoint it to. You're a good kid. I needed to get help in that house, and I needed it really soon. John, pick up. It's me. It's Stacy. John, are you there? Look, um, John, there's something attacking Jamie. I need you. I'm really scared. The next morning, in Connecticut, Zaphis gets Stacy's message. Am I very concerned about Jamie? Absolutely. This is a very personal situation. They're my friends, they're like family. He's been like this ever since you were last in town, and um, with all the noises and, and stuff flying around, it just everything pointed to a poltergeist. Jamie is the the right age. Yeah, and then last night, these scratches just appeared on his chest. That's no poltergeist. She just looked right up at me, and she says, this is what I didn't want to hear. This is what I didn't want to know. Stacy, what happened in that cemetery? Well, um, I just let Jamie mess around with those dowsing rods. Oh I thought they were harmless. Far from it. Those occult relics attract. By playing with the dowsing rods, he opened up the doors where something actually came in and attached to him. This is all my fault. Look. I felt so guilty. If a client had called me up and said all these things had happened, I would take that very seriously and, and get help as soon as I could. And I, in my own case, I didn't do that. Hello? Mom? Honey, I told John everything. What? Would you mind showing me the scratches? Why? Jamie, please. Oh, my poor baby. He lifted his shirt up, and he had brand new scratches. Jamie was being tormented. Jamie, um, I think a demonic entity has attached itself to you. It's the only explanation for what's been happening. We were definitely dealing with something on a demonic level. Its main objective is to wear the person down. It wanted him to cross over. It wanted to gain control of his soul. So is this just going to keep going on and on? It might. It depends on you. John thinks you need an exorcism. There's a priest in Connecticut who can help. No. Jamie, it's stop, the only stop, way. Stop. It's the only stop. way. No. You try to comprehend what 
is going to happen from like movies you saw exorcist the girl throws up puke afterwards like she's her, she's like scarred up and stuff it's like do i really want that Without Jamie's consent, there can be no exorcism. It's a very weird feeling thinking about what's going to happen. It was overwhelming. Jamie, I love you more than anything in this world. Please, son, for me, come to Connecticut. Thank you. That weekend, Stacy and Jamie drive to Connecticut for the exorcism. I was afraid for Jamie. I was afraid of what they were going to do, but I knew that this was the only way, this was the only answer that we had. Zaffis has arranged for the exorcism to take place in the home of Father Larry Elward, an independent priest. To perform the ancient rite, Larry will follow the Roman ritual a Catholic text from the sixth century. Basically, the ritual is a, an expression of prayer, proclaiming the power and the healing and deliverance power of God. His wife, Debbie, has the gift of discernment. During the exorcism, she crosses the threshold, separating the physical world from the spiritual. Oh, I think they're here. I will feel what the person is going through. I can also see and hear the demon. I am witness to both sides. Jamie was very nervous, very scared, very apprehensive. I think it's kind of scary for him to accept that I was just as scared as he was. I'm glad you came. Yeah. Hey, Jamie, it's gonna be all right. Come on, you guys. Jamie, please sit down. Once the exorcism begins, Zaphis knows the demon will feel threatened. Whatever happens, I need you to keep your distance. Right. I understand. He fears the demon could lash out at Stacy through okay. Jamie. You secure his left side, I'll secure his right. When a demonic presence enters the room, I feel very nauseous. My skin seems to crawl. Despite the pain, Debbie must focus on discerning the demon's name. Demons don't like to be recognized or acknowledged. By using their name, we are getting power over the demon. Larry opens the ritual with the litany of the saints. Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy. Have mercy on us. God the Father in heaven. Have mercy on us. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. started to change. He almost looked like a different person. Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you who cast the most evil tyrant into the depths of hell for eternity, you who sacrificed your only son that he might crush this venomous serpent. I've almost got a name. Concentrate. Holy and most merciful Father, we beseech you 
throne here to save this child by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the last judgment of God. Hear my command. Tell me your name. Debbie psychically steps into Jamie's head. The entity was trying to stop the ritual through this vision that Jamie was seeing. Jamie thought he was lashing out at Larry and at me, but that never happened. This is the name we've been getting. Your tomb. Nothingness, worthlessness, vanity. Larry can now target the demon with its own name. Behold the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Tremble before its power, evil enemy. Flee from its ancient majesty and might. Jesus is our strength. slowly just went away, went away. And then I realized I was done. The whole thing was done. In the months following the exorcism, Jamie's life returns to normal. This period of my life was just so incredibly depressing. Everything's better now. You think you can keep up with your own? You're going down there. <laughs> I'll play the winner. <laughs> Stacy can't help thinking back to the night that she let Jamie tag along at the cemetery. Do I regret it? Yes, I do regret it. I wish I could go back and leave Jamie home but almost in a way, it made us grow stronger. Now, it's almost like there's this unspoken bond between us because we've been through it together, and we got past it, and we'll move on for the future. Make a run. 